Saturday on Channel 602. Welcome back into the show. Let's talk about the developments in the bond space globally in the overnight session. Jonathan Sheridan from FIG. Jonathan, welcome to you. It's sort of uh, the case that normalization is likely to start soon in the U.S. We know this much. We've seen, if anything, movement at the longer end of the curve. I'm wanting to know perhaps tonight, though, what, might there be something on the radar that we're not quite paying uh, due attention to? For instance, you've got producer prices, retail sales, and consumer sentiment. What about that retail sales number? Is there a chance that that could prove the fly in the ointment and royal the bond market. Good afternoon, Carson. Yeah, look, I mean, retail sales obviously points to consumer demand, and as we know, the U.S. market is uh, about a 70 percent, uh, sorry, U.S. economy is about 70 percent based on on consumption. So, uh, you know, a weaker retail sales print could delay the Fed in in their rate hike. But retail sales numbers tend to be relatively volatile, and and what central bankers tend to look at is the trend, and and they'll be seeing that trend, uh, you know, being on on the improvement over the last 12 to 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. The way that this all played into the domestic bond, yeah, yeah, very little movement. But uh, in terms of the eye tracks and the levels there that you know we've been come to, coming to expect for most of the year, we've seen a bit of a breakout uh, above 100. So the significance of that now to have had occurred. Yeah, so what, uh, what the ITRAX measures is a, a sort of generic five-year credit spread. So basically for investment grade issuers, what they have to pay over the swap rate to issue a five-year bond. And, and as you said, we've seen that for most of the year under 100 points. Um, in the last sort of three weeks or so, it's pushed uh, out to as high as 130 actually uh, after rallying back in the last week or so to 116. So what that really means is that um, borrowing costs for investment grade issuers, which is the majority of the Australian bond market have increased by about 15% uh, or so uh, over the last month or so. And do you kind of get a sense that that has been, it's, it's dissuading a number of corporates from actually putting down uh, these on the table, that they would rather hold things over maybe till January, maybe just to see how things have, I mean, I, I suppose you run a real risk though, don't you? you? You delay and you see a whole class of investors maybe just away from the action in, in a period of time, but maybe that's the price worth paying. Yeah, look, it's interesting. I think it, it depends on the individual issuer. So, you know, our bond market is dominated by financials and resources companies, much like the ASX. Mm. So banks are always issuing. So, you know, they, they have rolling funding programs and, and it's their treasurer's job to maintain a broad base uh, across their funding sources. So uh, it's all about net interest margin for the banks and, and as regular issuers they don't necessarily get exposed to the market at one particular time. Uh, for other less frequent issuers you can see it being a problem. Um, QBE for example issued some sub debt a while ago, uh, about a month ago, which was initially priced at 350 over. They waited a week uh, and then they had to actually issue it at 400 over. So you know those, those moves can be quite marked for the less frequent issuers and as you say um, you know if there's a particular investor set that's waiting and ready with cash at one particular time, then you can get a better deal than if, if you uh, try to issue when they're not with, ready and waiting with the cash. Your perspective on the ANZ struggle to persuade its investors on uh, the, I suppose, the sustainability of the dividend in light of uh, franking credit. Have you ever been of the view to say, look, these credits are only of value if you're a shareholder uh, who receives them, uh, they see no value in keeping surplus credits just in the system. Is that, to your mind, you know, enough of, of an explanation at this point in time? I think I think uh, every company that you know, unless they have a significant surplus of franking, uh, and they're not uh, necessarily driven by their dividends that they pay, uh, mm. are going to you know, manage their franking balance as best they can to their to their own uh, to their own benefit. So, the banks in particular, and the other big dividend payers such as Telstra, you know, they're they're really attractive for their for their dividend yields. And as you say, if you can utilise that franking, which particularly self manage super funds in pension phase can, then that's, that's clearly a significant factor in decision making as to whether to invest in those stocks for yield or whether to go into another asset class 
for example, bonds. Um, it's a it's a conundrum that we see all the time when um, when looking, you know, to allocate funds into bonds. Is that investors are, are effectively addicted to the free uh, revenue they get from franking? So, you know, uh, my view is that you know you should look at risk as the first measure when you invest, and if you're after capital and income stability, then equities probably is not the best place to go mm. for that in the first instance. All right, Jonathan, as always, thank you. Have a great afternoon and weekend. Thanks. Thanks for asking me too. Jonathan Sheridan from the